All right. Hi, and welcome to our next episode of Mosaics Today. I'm Rachel Gilmore here with Mark DeMoz, um, and we are going to talk about an issue that hopefully, well, not hopefully, unfortunately, most of us are experiencing in culture today. Um, so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there is polarization right now in the United States. I mean, look at polarization when it comes to politics and, you know, the events that happened in January at the Capitol. Let's look at polarization when it comes to race relations in the U.S. and all the work that needs to be done here. And at the same time as there's all this polarization, we're also realizing the increasing diversity in the United States of America. You know, some of the early census reports are showing that one in four Americans identify as non-white. What does that mean when most of our churches are, are not that diverse? You know, how do we start to bridge that gap? How do we truly embrace um, this multi-ethnic approach to ministry? Um, so some of the things, uh, I was impacted last week in Mark and I were just talking before this podcast. I wish you could have joined us on that conversation uh, about an article that came out in Christianity Today written by Corey Edwards about how hard it is. We won't talk about the title of that article, but the content was really good. And um, Corey just mentioned that multi-ethnic ministry is hard. It's been on an important road and journey, and yet we haven't fully actualized what we feel God calling us to do. So all of this polarization is happening while we're becoming more diverse. We all say we want multi-ethnic churches, but what is the biblical foundation? If we can't ground this approach in scripture, then we shouldn't even be here. Mosaics today shouldn't exist. Mark and I should not be talking. So Mark, you mentioned on the last podcast that you really took some time when you realized that the only people of color at the church were the janitorial staff. You know, what is God saying about this? Tell us a little bit about that journey, what you realized, what the theology is behind this mosaics movement. Yeah, in this episode, that's what we want to talk about is that why, but you set it up great, Rachel, talking about the sociology and the times. You know, the Bible says the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what was right for Israel to do. And we as men and women in the church and Christ followers and ministry leaders, we have to understand the times and know what is right for the church to do in this moment. And this, again, is all about uh, good, strong theology. You know, Christ taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. We know the kingdom of heaven is not segregated. Revelation 7, 9, every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, walking, working, work, uh, worshiping God together as one for all eternity. If the kingdom of heaven is not segregated, why on earth is the local church? And, and the statistics you're citing, Rachel, today in terms of polarization, in terms of changing demographics, we have a problem because an increasingly diverse society no longer finds credible the message of God's love for all people. Why? because we by and large preach it from segregated pulpits and pews. Today, just 77% of evangelical churches and 89% of mainline churches fail to have at least 20% diversity in their attending membership. Uh, and, and yet we preach a message of God's love for all people. That message is unbelievable due to, again, to the systemic segregation of the church. So what Rachel and I are talking about, folks, and encouraging you uh, to build a healthy multi-ethnic church uh, this isn't because of changing demographics, although that's true. This is not necessarily because of painful polarization, although that's true. This is biblical. This is right. This is the hope of the gospel. And it's our only hope as a church of advancing a credible message of God's love for all people, not just some, again, as Rachel said, an increasingly diverse society. So in the late 90s, when I looked around this otherwise amazing church I was a part of and realized the only people of color were on the custodial staff, um, that led me into the New Testament, particularly, uh, because I wanted to see, was it true, in fact, as I had been taught in seminary, that the New Testament church was segregated, uh, that there were uh, churches filled with Jewish believers, and there were churches filled with Gentile believers? Was that true? Was it true that the way to plant, grow, and develop a church was to focus on a single people group, as I had been taught uh, through a misalignment, uh, misrepresentation of Donald McGavard's homogeneous unit principle. So when I did my own homework, so to speak, and, and by the way, not tooting my own horn, but at that time I had a, a master's in exegetical theology, today a D-min in exegetical theology, I did my own homework throughout those seminary notes, uh, so to speak, dove into the exegetical study of the New Testament church in terms of its nature, its ecclesiology, and, and came to realize that every church in the New Testament outside of Jerusalem was what we would call today a multi-ethnic church. Men and women, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, willing themselves to walk, work, and worship God together as one beyond distinctions. And it was that demonstration 
of the power of the gospel of Christ to be lifted up and draw all people, not just some people to himself, that advanced the message of God's love for all people in a credible way. So it wasn't just proclamation, it was demonstration. And that's what we've got to recover in the 21st century. You know, in the 20th century, Rachel, it was all about proclamation. You brought Billy Graham to your city. He clearly explained the gospel. People got saved. You went to Myrtle Beach. You shared the four spiritual laws. You tapped people on the shoulder. Hey, if you died tonight, do you know if you go to heaven? No, I don't. Let me explain it to you. You rolled it out in the four spiritual laws. You gave people books by a man named Josh McDowell, evidence that demands a verdict or more than a carpenter, clearly laid out the case, as Lee Strobel would say later, the case for Christ, and it explained it. It proclaimed this message in a clear way, and people got saved. In the 21st, it's not proclamation that's getting it done, because words fall on deaf ears. It's all about good works. It's about demonstration. We have to demonstrate in a variety of ways, rooted in our unity and diversity through the local church, Christ lifted up, drawing all people into himself. This good work, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 10, for we collectively, the church, are his workmanship, uh, workmanship. and this church, that is the multi-ethnic, economically diverse church, is that good work of the church that Christ envisioned long ago. So I'm going to stop right there because I do want to share with you all listening these three foundational theological pillars I found in the New Testament uh, when I did my own work because they form essentially the foundation of the, of the theology, a theological foundation of the movement. But Rachel, in light of just what I shared, let me throw it back to you. As you think about the tie between sociology and theology, because again, it's not about, you know, uh, as the late Rodney King asked us all to get along, right? There is a biblical why, there's a theological mandate, and we have to understand that, that this isn't about political correctness, it's about biblical correctness, not just nice, but necessary, not optional, but biblical. When you think about that, from a biblical or theological perspective, what comes to your mind? Wow. Well, I mean, I'm drawn to the passage in Galatians, right? Which says in Christ, there's no male or female, Gentile or Greek. Like we serve a God who, who wants to bring us together, who wants us to be the body of Christ and knows that we're stronger when we're not all arms or legs or noses or eyes. Um, so for me, theologically, especially as a female in ministry, um, it was important for me to go to the word of God and say, wow, you know, there are some people who don't feel that I have a right to be here and in leadership. What is God saying? What are the scriptures that I can cling to? What are the stories of female children? church planters that I see in the New Testament as well. And it's in this um, place of diversity, like you said, diverse communities. That was what the church was like in Acts. Um, it, it's brought me comfort. And I can say that when I reach out and talk to and work alongside multi-ethnic churches, that they are much more welcoming of, of all God's people. Like you said, Jesus draws all people unto himself. So, you know, you see echoes of the importance of diversity that we serve a God who, who reaches out to the marginalized, who creates space for you know, the first person in all of scripture to give God a name is Hagar, who says, you are the God who sees me. And so, you know, seeing echoes of that that are fully lived out in the flesh, in the New Testament, in that early church, um, is just a reminder that if we are not seeking diversity, if we're not preaching it, if we're not living it, like you said, um, then, then all of our great sermons or, you know, Bible quotations will fall on deaf ears because especially younger generations like myself, millennials, Gen Z, they don't care what you have to say if they don't see it lived out, if they don't see you embracing this multi-ethnic, sociologically and economically diverse um, structuring your faith community. And, and they're longing for that. They're hungering to see no more polarization, but us come together. And when you can say, listen, this isn't coming about just now in the 21st century. This was God's plan all along. I mean, it hits them like a ton of bricks. Like, wow, God has been longing for the same thing that I've been longing for as well. So I'm excited to hear more of your principles. Why don't you unpack them for us, what you learned about? Yeah, that sounds great. You know, I've taken to reframing a quote uh, in, in these more recent days. It's a quote by a Unitarian University a Unitarian minister in the 1850s made popular by Dr. Martin Luther King and President Barack Obama. The quote originally is the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Uh, I've taken to reframing it uh, uh, even along the lines of some of the things you're sharing, Rachel, to say that the arc of the biblical narrative bends towards multi-ethnicity. In other words, we're all going to get there, folks, whether you like it or not, whether you recognize it or not, Revelation 7-9 is coming. Christ taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. We have to be pursuing this at a corporate sanctification level, just like an individual sanctification. We're on a journey, so must be the church towards Revelation 7-9. Now, having said that, what are the three foundational theological uh, pillars 
upon which this movement is built. As I said, as I got into the New Testament, I discovered these, that Christ envisioned the multi-ethnic church on the night before he died. That's the first theological foundation. Christ envisioned the multi-ethnic church on the night before he died, John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, where he calls us to be one, that is believers, disciples who come after, believers who come after the disciples that were in the room, so to speak, then he prays for us that we would be one. Why? So that the world would know God's love and believe. Christ envisioned the multi-ethnic church on the night before he died, John 17, 20 through 23. Secondly, uh, Luke describes this, that is the multi-ethnic church in action as a model for the church going forward in a place called Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 26, even into chapter 13, 1, you go to the website of the church at Antioch, believe it or not, it's there. In Acts chapter 13, 1, this church is led by five leaders, two are from Africa, one from Asia Minor, one from the Mediterranean, and one from the Middle East. Uh, so Acts, uh, uh, Acts chapter 11 is the rise of the church at Antioch. It's, the, it's everything you want to be, folks. It's mega missional, multi-site, and yes, multi-ethnic. It's where believers were first said to be like Christ. In the multi-ethnic version, the multi-ethnic nature of the church at Antioch, different, by the way, than the homogeneous nature of the church at Jerusalem. So what you need to understand is it's not Jerusalem that is the model church of the New Testament. It's Antioch. Antioch, this multi-ethnic expression of God's love for all people. So uh, the theological foundations, again, first, Christ envisioned the multi-ethnic church on the night before he died. Luke describes it in action at a place called Antioch. But thirdly, uh, the Apostle Paul prescribes it. That is, the Apostle Paul prescribes that churches, wherever possible, and certainly in the United States of America in the 21st century, it is possible to establish healthy, multi-ethnic, and economically diverse churches. Paul prescribes this throughout his life and throughout his writings. In the book of Romans, in the book of Ephesians, and in Corinthians, and Galatians, as you mentioned, and Colossians. In fact, three times in the New Testament, Paul describes this vision of Gentiles being one with the Jews in salvation, one with the Jews in a local church, and one with the Jews in the coming kingdom of God as his own gospel. My gospel, he says, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 through 27, may God establish you according to my gospel, my good news, rooted in the capital G gospel, that is the gospel of atonement, salvation by a grace through faith that rests only in Jesus Christ. Because of that great capital G gospel salvation, Paul says, I got good news for all of you who are Gentiles. You are one no different with the Jews in salvation. You are one no different with the Jews in the local church, and you will be one with the Jews no different joint heirs with Jesus in the coming kingdom of God. So Christ envisions the multi of the church. Luke describes it in action, and Paul prescribes it throughout his life and writings. Again, it's not just nice, it's necessary, it's not optional, it's biblical. I love that. And I love that you ended with Paul and like how he talks about that in Romans. And it reminds me of Paul and his conflict with Peter, right? Who didn't get it initially. He's like, but wait, everyone has to become Jewish. It has to be done this way. You have to eat this food. And in Acts 10, God, you know, God self speaks to Peter and says, you know, if I've made something pure, don't call it unclean, you know, with the image that he had um, of all the food. And so sometimes we get hung up on our tradition, on our practices, and it keeps us from seeing what God is really calling us to do, who God is calling us to be. So, um, you know, I'm mindful of a quote from Yaroslav Pelikan that says, uh, tradition is the living faith of dead people. Traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. And how many churches today are so like tied and bound to traditionalism that they're unwilling to open up their hearts, their lives, their Bibles to see this multi-ethnic way of ministry and to really embrace that so they can have a living faith once again, something to pass on to coming generations. So I love that. I love how you laid it out. I love the three different pillars and the way that it all begins with kind of Christ's dying wish to us, right? Before the crucifixion that we may be one. So that's powerful. That's beautiful. Well, yeah. I've written about this. My first book, if you're interested in that, building a healthy multi on the church it mines this theology uh, uh again john 17 acts 11 the book of ephesians particularly i took on in that first book where you can dive into this and see what we're talking about you know rachel you probably had uh opportunity in your life to buy a brand new car maybe or brand new to you maybe it is brand new i should say or maybe it's just new to you but it's new to you this car 
And prior to owning that car, you didn't really see it around. But now that you have the car, you see it everywhere. I remember my wife and I, we bought one brand new car in our life. It was a Honda Odyssey. I rolled that thing off. I had four kids, rolled it off the lot. I thought I was the coolest dad in town. You know, it had the automatic doors. It was just, just an awesome vehicle back in the day. Man, when I rolled that off, I saw it everywhere. Honda Odysseys were everywhere. And that's what we're talking about when we get into the theology of the New Testament related to the nature of the church, why it is to be multi-ethnic for advancing, for the sake of advancing a credible gospel. I'm not just picking and choosing passages here, folks. Uh, it is everywhere in the New Testament. And once you get the code, so to speak, once you lock into the things that we're talking about today in this theology, again, you will see it everywhere. For instance, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as much as we love to preach that passage at weddings, right, that passage, exegetically speaking, has nothing to do with a man loving his wife or a wife loving her husband in the context of marriage. If you back up into 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about Jew-Gentile love. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles, believing Jews and Gentiles, uh, coming to Christ and then into the church, learning to love one another. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about gifts, right? As you referenced earlier, uh, Rachel, that uh, all, all these varying gifts and it puts together like a body and where to work. But at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, but still I will show you a more excellent way. The question is a more excellent way for what? It's a more excellent way to be one in the church to advance a credible gospel. And that's when he goes into love, 1 Corinthians 13, because we can have all the gifts. You can, as he says, right, you can preach with the tongues of men, but if you don't have love, and he's talking about, again, not love man to woman, but love for your biblical neighbor, people who are very different than you, according to Luke chapter 10, that love is what gets the job done. As John, as Christ said in John 17, they will see us as one and they will come to know the God, that, that God's love is for all people, that Christ is Messiah, and they will get saved as we are one in the church for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Galatians, you mentioned chapter three, right? Men are not better than women. Jews are not better than Gentiles. The rich are not better than the poor. This is consistent with the message of Paul. Philippians chapter two, uh, when he calls us to have this attitude in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says, don't merely look out for your own personal interests. And by the way, he's not talking about Mark the Maz or Rachel. Yes, that's true. But he's talking about uh, the collective group of people. Jews do not just look out for Jewish interest in the church. Or in modern context, we'd say Blacks or Hispanics. Don't just look out for the interest of your own people group in this church. Consider the needs of, the pe of other people groups that are a part of this church. And then he says, to do that, you're going to have to have this attitude in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. That is, just to be kept selfishly unto himself. It says, though, he emptied himself, right? What did he empty himself of? Power, position, and privilege. Yeah. He emptied himself, or he leveraged these things. And rather than play king of the hill like the old schoolyard game and push everybody down and keep others down, he came down to lift us up, to push us up the hill as it were, and to give us spiritual power, spiritual position, spiritual uh, privilege in the heavenly places. This is what Paul's talking about. And when you know Paul, you understand what he's talking about when he says that Christ emptied himself in humility and obedience. That's what he's calling us as pastors to do as well. Uh, one other quick uh, revelation too. What's the first love? that the church at Ephesus left in 90 AD. It's not a relational love for Jesus as if they're doing all these great works, but somehow they have left their relational love, their priority love for Christ. That's not what the Greek word means. The Greek word is protos or proton, where we get the prototype from, right? It's a love that you had in the beginning at the first is how that should be translated. How do you know what love the church at Ephesus left in Revelation 2, roughly 90 AD? In the beginning, what love did they have in the beginning? right? You go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, some 30 or so years earlier, Paul says, and for this reason, church at Ephesus, I haven't, uh, I, I continue to pray for you, having heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. The love that was left in 90 AD was not a priority love for Jesus. It was a prior love for all the saints. And you see segregation, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, this division, the tool of the devil to divide us along the lines of the color of our skin and our cultural heritage. You see that creeping into the church at Ephesus in 90 AD. And what does Jesus say? If you don't get back to loving all people, 
right? Not just some people, but all the saints, the way you did at the first, I'm going to take away your anointing. And boy, isn't that where the church in America is today to recover the credible witness. We've got to get back to that first love of all the saints, not just some in and through the local church. I love that. And I, and I think part of that comes from like our fear of really listening to the Holy Spirit, because if we're truly listening to God and where the Spirit is calling us, it's out of our comfort zone, right? It's out of our own context. And to see those whom God loves as well, that we need to encounter, that we need to share Christ with. And I'm reminded of Acts 8, you know, with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, who's like, well, I'm reading Isaiah, but I don't understand it. Who's going to explain it to me? And Philip says, I will, you know, and he baptizes him right there. He leaves, he runs to that man in the chariot and says, like, this is the God that we have in common. Let's be one in Christ Jesus. So yeah, we definitely need more of that. The church has lost that. Again, like, I'll go back to this whole, I've, I've learned so much over this last year about you know, this colonial approach to church planting, which happens in so many contexts where we say, okay, you know, I'm Rachel, I'm here in Virginia Beach. So I'm going to tell you who God is, what version of scripture you should read, what songs we're going to sing, what the order of worship will look like, what ministry will like look like. We will have a UMW circle. We will have this and that without saying, where has God been at work at this community before I arrived? You know, how can I be one with what God and the Holy Spirit has already been doing here? How can I listen and learn and love and walk alongside and then mobilize us together to continue to transform the community. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's huge, it's hard, but you're right, it's crucial and it goes back to scripture. And if this is what we wanna preach and do and be, then it all starts with this multi-ethnic message. And hopefully selfishly, you yeah. know, my prayer is that it's more than 20% one day, make sure a multi-ethnic church, 20% non-dominant culture. But um, but like you said, baby steps. Yeah, this is a movement about- that just began in the last few decades, right? Absolutely. Baby steps. It's a maturing process. And this movement, depending on uh, how you date it, is either eight to 20 years old. Uh, I've done some work on that with Christianity Day, et cetera. And so when you think about it, let's just say that the movement's 16 years old. Think about a 16-year-old kid, right? Come a long way, got a long way to go. You wouldn't say a 16-year-old is fully mature. And yet at the same time, a 16-year-old is driving a car and they've gotten down the road a bit, so to speak. So that's where the movement is today, folks. It's not fully mature, but it is maturing. And people jumping in right now need to go back and understand the theological history and the history, the project, uh, all the way back to Divided by Faith in 20 in 2000, to follow the trajectory. Just one quick stat. Today, some people uh, uh, might look at the multi-ethnic church and say, well, only 17% of churches classified as multiracial are led by people of color, as if that's bad. Well, of course, we want to see that improve, but it is improving because 15 years ago, guess what that number was? 4% but people don't know that in the moment. So you need to go back and recover the history of the movement back to Divided by Faith. That's the book I'd recommend you read to get started on this journey, as well as the trajectory of this movement for the past 20 years. Things are going in the right direction, but as you say, Rachel, we're going to need to mature. And one other thing on the theology side I wanna bring up, because you're talking about colonialism, uh, using that word in terms of how we plant, grow and develop churches. Specifically, that is a misapplication of the homogeneous unit principle first brought to America by a man named Donald McGavern in 1966. He brought it from the country of India. He mined this principle there, and he began to teach at Fuller in 1966. The principle, the homogeneous unit principle, uh, says this, that people come to Christ fastest when they don't have to jump through uh, linguistic and cultural barriers. Simply put, Donald McGavern observed that from a human standpoint, although God can use any of us to reach any, any of us, right? Uh, anyone, what McGavern observed in India was this, that if you connect, let's say it like this, the fastest way from a human standpoint to reach a first generation uh, Chinese person with the gospel is to connect them with a first generation Chinese believer, right? They speak the same language, they have the same culture. Of course, in China, there's multiple languages, but assume it's from the same dialect, if you will. Uh, But the point is you connect people uh, who are like, and this from human standpoint, Uh, standpoint is the fastest way to advance the gospel, to see someone come to Christ without, again, having to overcome cultural or linguistic barriers. In 1972, a man named Peter Wagner began to spin that principle and to misapply it from its original intent, and he began to apply it to the local church. So since 1972, specifically in the United States and in Western Europe, this principle has been the governing uh, way in which we plant growing churches. And what Wagner taught it as is this, that the church grows fastest when it's homogeneous. 
So in other words, when you target a people group to plant, grow, or develop a church, and you say, you do as you said, Rachel, you give them the music they want, the color of carpet they want, the preaching style, you put it in this uh, neighborhood and town they want it, they will come, but they are just from one segment of the population. It's like target marketing. McGavern said to Martin Marty in 1978, Martin Marty, one of the foremost scholars in American church history, University of Chicago, in 1978, Martin Marty challenged this misunderstanding of the principle, because think about it, McGavern said, uh, this is how people come to Christ. Wagner applied it to, this is how you grow a church, and that's a nuanced difference. Martin Marty challenged the principle, he said, is it biblical? And McGavern said in a letter to Martin Marty, do I beg of you, think of it uh, primarily as an evangelistic and discipleship principle. And he went on to say this, Rachel, he said, there is a danger. This is Donald McGavern in 1978, he said, there is a danger that churches misapplying the homogeneous unit principle, in other words, not applying it for evangelism and discipleship, but applying it to church planting, growth, and development. Uh, as Wagner spun it, he said, there is a danger that churches misapplying this principle will become exclusive, arrogant, and racist. And he said, that danger must be resolutely combated. That is a direct quote from Donald McGavern in 1978. Let me ask you, Rachel, how do you think we've done as a church over the past 50 years? Have we done a good job of resolutely combating the misapplication of the homogeneous principle, what you call colonialism? I'd say not. What do you say? I, I would agree completely. Hook, line, and sinker. That's why we are where we are. Unfortunately, that he was a prophet. Uh, in a negative way that's that's hurt our churches. And so something I appreciate about you, I can't remember if it was our first or second conversation, is you not only unpack this whole theological framework, this biblical why of multi-ethnic um, church ministry, but you also uh, reiterated the importance of our spiritual leaders preaching this, teaching this all the time. You can't just have this be one initial sermon one month and then circle back around to it a year or two later, right? Like we need to live and breathe this theology so that we continue to realize, bump up against our racism or the practices that are actually not Christ-like, that are tearing us apart and begin to shift to shuv in the Hebrew word, right? To repent and uh, do a 180, do things differently. So... Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, and we don't just read the Bible one time, right? We don't just yeah. read the Bible. <laughs> Hell, I've, I've already read Psalm 23. I don't need to read it again, right? No, <laughs> I mean, you don't you don't take that approach in your own spiritual life. Why would you expect the church wouldn't take that intentional approach? And by the way, we're intentional on everything else. We're intentional about worship. If you're a pastor listening, let me ask you a question. Do you plan your worship service? Are you intentional? Do you think about, okay, we'll do an announcement here. We'll do a song here. We'll preach here. We'll put a video here. What about discipleship, evangelism? Think about small groups. Are you intentional about how you approach these things? Well, why in the world then, when it comes to the healthy diversity and the structural health of your church, uh, according to the things we've been talking about, why would we just say, well, if God means it to be, that's what's going to happen? Like, as if it's up to God to make our church a diverse. No, we are to be intentional in partnership with him to apply these biblical truths to build healthy, multi-ethnic, economically diverse churches. Again, not because it's cool, not because you're curious, not because it's culturally relevant, but because it's biblical, it's right. It's the only hope we have of advancing a credible gospel in the 21st century. I completely agree. I mean, I'm a mom to a nine and a 12 year old and everyone has different parenting styles. And I had friends who were like, oh, I'll give my kids options of what they want to eat. And if they only want chicken nuggets and ice cream, that's all they'll eat. And I'm like, listen, vegetables matter. Water matters. Like, I'm not going to give them a choice. I know this is important. I know it's what's going to make them strong. I know it's what's best for their body. And so I'm not going to make it optional. I'm not going to have, you know, carrots on the menu once a month because they would prefer French fries, you know, with covered in cheese or whatnot. So the same goes for our spiritual food, right? Like in the church, we need to make sure that we're nourishing people with what they need the most. It might not be the most palatable because we're so entrenched in these, you know, systems of racism that it's hard to hear that ugly truth that, wow, if there is no multi-ethnicity in any of our, anything that we do in terms of outreach and the worship and the life of the church, if we, if we don't understand it, if we're not advocating for it, then we're falling short of God's call in our lives. People don't always want to hear it, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that we should shy away from it. So it could be just what we need to, to become healthy the way God has called us to be. So um, love that. I love this. I love that we're starting with this biblical why we're grounding it in theology um, and I'm so grateful for everything that you shared with us today, Mark, from a lifetime of ministry, right, that you've learned early on and then you've lived out, as you said, over the decades. So um, I hope that our 
You guys listening in have learned as much from this conversation as I have that you've really um, been challenged by it and are excited to implement it in your local context. And I also really hope that you join us for our next podcast where we'll be talking more about justice, that justice isn't um, peripheral, but it's intrinsic to the gospel. So what does justice look like in multi-ethnic churches? I hope you tune in. Join us then. If you have any questions or if there's anything you want us to know, please blow up our social media, reach out, email us. We care about you. Your voice matters. Um, so thank you again. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody, for joining us at Mosaics today.